arahato samma sambudasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambudasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambudasa Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. We pay homage to him and to his. So I'm happy to see all of you. I thought that was a beautiful picture of the lake with the with the mountains. I did. That was beautiful, Jonathan. <laughs> it was wonderful. It looks like the um, we have a picture of the lake uh, near Damasuka. There's a big lake, and it has not such big mountains as that. We just have little tiny hills, but it's pretty nice anyway. It reminded me of that. Okay, so today we are going to look at. Uh, at the sutta that <clears throat> don't do this very often. But I like this one because, because I was involved with horses and cows and things like that. And, and because uh, training horses is a lot of fun. And in this story, Badali is the name of the horse trainer. And in the story, uh, it, I'm just going to read it. We're going to see if we can get through this. It has a lot of turnbacks that we're going to go through, and then we'll talk about it. It goes through the different ways of training a person and tells you a lot about the monks, too. So this is Majima Nikaya number 65, Badali Sutta to Badali. <clears throat> So thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anapapindika's Park. And there he addressed the monks thus. Monks, venerable sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this to them. Monks, I eat at a single session. People ask me about this all the time. How do you survive eating a single session? Now let's see what he says about this. And by doing so, I am free from illness and affliction. And I enjoy lightness and strength and comfortable abidings. Come monks, eat at a single session. By so doing, you too will be free from illness and affliction, and you will enjoy lightness and strength and comfortable abidings. When this was said, the Venerable Vidali told the Blessed One, I am not willing to eat at a single session, for if I were to do so, I might have worry and anxiety about it. Then Vidali, eat one part there, where you are invited and bring away one part to eat. By eating in that way, you will maintain yourself. So in the morning when we take our bulls and go on alms round, the way it worked for me was I was walking alms in Palakeli in Sri Lanka. And when I have my bull and we're going back, to where I'm staying and the other two nuns were going back to the school where they were staying. And I do the blessings on the food and then I eat a little bit for breakfast and take the other part with me for the noonday meal at the school where the monks and nuns eat this is the way we were doing it. So then he says, venerable sir, I am not willing to eat in that way either. Uh-oh, <laughs> for if I were to do so, I might also have worry and anxiety about it still. Then when this training precept was being made known by the Blessed One, when the Sangha of Bhikkhus was undertaking the training, Venerable Vidali declared his refusal to comply. And then the Venerable Vidali did not present himself to the Blessed One for the whole 
time of three month period of the rains retreat. As happens with one who does not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. He was not allowed to come to ask questions. He was not allowed to present himself uh, with the teacher if he was going to blatantly dis dis um, avow one of the precepts. Now on that occasion, a number of monks, they were engaged in making up a robe for the blessed one. And they were thinking, with this robe completed at the end of the three months of the rains retreat, the blessed one will then set out on his wandering. And then the venerable Badali, he went uh, to those monks and engaged, exchanged greetings with them. And when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side. And when he had done so, they said to him, <clears throat> friend Badali, this robe is being made up for the Blessed One. With this robe completed at the end of the three months rains retreat, the Blessed One will set out for wandering. Please, friend Badali, give proper attention to this advice. Do not let it become more difficult for you later on. Yes, friends, he replied, and he went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and he said to him, Venerable sir, a transgression overcame me in that like a fool, confused and blundering, when a training precept was being made known by the Blessed One, when the Sangha of monks was undertaking the training, I declared my refusal to reply, comply. Venerable sir, may the blessed one forgive my transgression, seen as such for the sake of restraint in the future. This is the proper way to apologize to the teacher that you have broken a rule. Ask for the teacher's forgiveness in such a way for the sake of restraint in the future so that you will improve yourself. And the system of monks was very forthright in asking in this way so that they would not carry the burden around with them in their mind. <clears throat> now surely, Badali, a transgression overcame you in that, like a fool, confused and blundering when the training precept was being known by me, when the Sangha Bhikkhus was undertaking the training, you declared your refusal to comply. Badali, this circumstance was not recognized by you. And the Blessed One is living at Sawati, and the Blessed One will know me thus. The bhikkhu named Badali is one who does not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. And this circumstance was not recognized by you. You didn't know that I would know what's happening. <clears throat> now also, this circumstance was not recognized by you. Many bhikkhus have taken up residence at Sawati for the rains, and they too will know me thus. The bhikkhu named Baba Badali is one who does not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. The circumstance too was not recognized by you. Also that this circumstance was not recognized by you. Many bhikkhunis have taken up residence at Sawati for the rains. They too will know me thus. The bhikkhu named Badali is one who does not fulfill the training of the teacher's dispensation. And this circumstance too was not recognized by you. Also, this circumstance was not recognized by you that many men, many lay followers, women lay followers are staying at Sawati and they too will know me thus. This bhikkhu named Badali is one who does not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. This circumstance too was not recognized by you. And also this circumstance was not recognized by you. Many recluses and Brahmins of other sects have taken up residence at Sawati for the rains, 
and they too will know me thus. The bhikkhu named Vidali, an elder disciple of the recluse Gautama, is one who does not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. So this circumstance too was not recognized by you. He did not take literally what would happen to him. If he disobeyed the precept, who would know about it? It just was a flutter and would just go all over to everyone. And venerable sir, a transgression overcame me in that like a fool, I was confused and blundering. And when a training precept was being made known by the blessed one, when the Sangha of Bhikkhus was undertaking that training, I declared my refusal to comply. Venerable sir, may the blessed one forgive my transgression, seen as such for the sake of restraint in the future. Surely, Badali, a transgression overcame you, and that like a fool, confused and blundering, when the training precept was being made known by me, when the Sangha of the Bhikkhus was undertaking the training, you declared your refusal to comply. What do you think, Badali? Suppose a monk here were one liberated in both ways. And I told him, come, Bhikkhu, be a plank for me across the mud. Would he walk across himself or would he dispose his body otherwise? Or would he say no? No, venerable sir. What do you think, Badali? Suppose a monk here were one liberated by wisdom or by body witness or one attained to his view, or liberated by faith, or a faith follower, or a faith, uh, a Dhamma follower, or a faith follower. And I told him, come, be a plank for me across the mud. Would he walk across himself? Would he dispose his body otherwise? Or would he say no? No, venerable sir. What do you think, Badali? Were you on that occasion one liberated in both ways, or one liberated by wisdom, or by a body witness, or one attained to view, or one liberated by faith, or a Dhamma follower, or a faith follower? No, venerable. Badali, on that occasion, were you not empty, hollow, and mistaken? Yes, venerable sir. Venerable sir, a transgression overcame me in that like a fool, confused and blundering. When a training precept was being made known by the Blessed One, when the Sangha of Bhikkhus was undertaking the training, I declared my refusal to comply. Venerable sir, may the blessed one forgive my transgression, seen as such for the sake of restraint in the future. Surely, Badali, a transgression overcame you, in that like a fool confused and blundering, when a training precept was being made known by me, when the Sangha and Bhikkhus was undertaking the training, you declared refusal to comply. But since you see your transgression as such, and you make amends in accordance with the Dhamma, we forgive you. And this is the process of the forgiveness for the monks when there is a break in the precepts, and we go to our teacher and we ask, and they forgive in this manner. For it is growth in the noble one's discipline when one sees one's transgression as such, make amends for it in accordance with the Dhamma by undertaking restraint for it in the future. And why is this important? Why? Because where you are practicing your practice to not ask forgiveness and to not go through this process, what happens to you? You carry it inside. You carry it in your mind, you carry it in your heart, and this is in there as a block. So when you cannot go deeper, when you cannot uh, go through the process, the steps of your development easily, what is it that blocks you? These are the kinds of things that block you. 
And when Vidali, some bhikkhus, do not fulfill the training in the te teacher's dispensation, he considers thus, Suppose I were to resort to a secluded resting place, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, a heap of straw. You've got quite a choice there. Perhaps I might realize a superhuman state a distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Perhaps you may be able to fall more easily into a level where you are able to observe the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape of the arising phenomena. That's how this works. He resorts to such a secluded resting place. And while he lives thus withdrawn, the teacher censures him. Wise companions in the holy life who have made investigation, they censure him. Gods may censure him and he censures himself. But being censured in this way by the teacher, by his wise companions in the holy life, by gods and by himself, he realizes no superhuman state no distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. And why is that? That is how it is with one who does not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. Basically what it's about is back up, <clears throat> go back and review the instructions, get down to the basics and then you criticize, critique yourself. When you go back to the instructions, I was going to do this. You might try and do it here, but I'm not sure if I have the right set with me. But if you have your basic instructions, your 10 minute instructions, if you find your 10 minute instruction in, um, in uh, some place where you can go through them and take the points, okay, that are the instructions to you. And then you critique yourself. What are you breaking in these in these instructions? And it goes, you know, deeper as you get more advanced and more knowledgeable of setting yourself up properly. We have an open mic. Can somebody check their mic, please? Uh, Prashant, uh, I think uh, your mic is open. Can you mute? Prashant, Prashant is, is open. There we go. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> when you break, when you go in and you look at the pieces of things, you see what they were doing was looking at all the pieces of instruction and all the things that you are learning and look yourself and see where you're breaking down. Now, like for instance, we have a, um, someone I'm working on. Where is that? Wait a minute. Hmm. I thought I had it right here. Well, maybe I do. Um, sometimes people will call me for coaching. They'll get in touch with me for coaching. And one of the first things we have to do is we have to figure out where they are. So suppose now I'm talking to you as you know, if you're if you're sharing or if you're attempting to teach or share, you need to look at this. When a person comes to you, it's like, hi, can you help me with my Meditation, okay, that's in, that's a line. <laughs> but who are you? What have you been practicing? How long have you been practicing that? And what are the what type of meditation was this? And what's happening to your mind and speech and body and heart system and everything when you're practicing? Now you have to figure out then in, if you're wanting help with twim, we have to sort of lasso you in, throw a rope and pull you in and make sure before we spend any time helping you that we're talking the same language. We have to be able to speak the same terminology that you're understanding. And if you're coming to us thinking you have to concentrate hard, well, we have to change that to just gently collect the mind and observe. You see, this is just an example. Okay, if you're talking about 
the terminology, we do change some of the words that Bhikkhu Bodhi used in translation. We do not change the meanings. So if I said to you, applied and sustained thought, and I want you to watch that happening in your mind, you might not really understand that. But if I said the same thing to you a different way, if I said, I want you to watch the thinking and examining thoughts and see if you can see the thinking thoughts coming up, they just pop up, but the examining thoughts, you personally engage them. So then what are you doing with them? What am I doing when I'm teaching you? But what are you doing in what you're practicing? It all comes back to, um, we have a, a broad base out there in the world of all meditation is just the same. No, it's not. And this is not just talking about twim and other things. This is talking about Vedante and, and I mean, you know, you could probably name four or five or six different ones these are all different, John, you know, this is, this is all different. And what do we mean by meditate? Meditation, what do we mean by mindfulness? What do we mean by craving? What is craving? You see, these are basics. So in order for us as a teacher to get involved in, in, in uh, you know, coaching someone, someone said to me once, why won't you coach me? I said, because you won't you won't come and spend time with me to sit down and sort out the basics first. I can't just bring you over and start talking to you when you don't understand what I'm saying. This is as serious as a Frenchman trying to speak to a German or a German trying to speak to a Russian. <laughs> this is just, you know, the same thing as two languages bumping into each other. Same problem. Okay, and so one of the first things that has to happen is the meeting has to take place in a, in a Zoom room for a little while of just trying to figure out what kind of basics do you have or have heard so far and what kind of basics am I talking about um, when I'm talking to you? I'll give you an example, um, you know, uh, how do you look at feeling? How important is feeling? But how do you personally view, look at feeling? What do you think about it? What do you know about it? And one person was very concerned about controlling feeling. Now, this goes back to an interesting um, exposure I had to someone who said, I figured out everything came into the interview and said, I figured out everything. I, this is good. Okay, what did you figure out? I don't have to suffer anymore. Okay, why? How, well, how did you do this? Because I'm not going to feel anything anymore. Therefore, I will not crave. You see, I understand dependent origination. I will not feel anymore. <laughs> well, I'm listening <laughs> as I'm sitting here with my pain pills at night. <laughs> I'm listening, you know, um, <laughs> you know, uh, because when I lie down right now, it's not a pleasant thing. I have to figure out. I, I've thought about this. I'm sort of examining suspension from the ceiling in sort of like a parachute seat where they could hang me sort of in a hammock. Maybe that would work and I, nothing would be touching my body while I'm sleeping. I have I have dreams about that. <laughs> you never know what I'll figure out anyway. Concentration, um, concentration is a big one because concentration is uh, indicating trying hard at something and concentrating is tension. And we're teaching the opposite of no tension and tightness. And the quick way to understand this, if you, if you can open up to just um, considering the quick way to understand this is where are you ultimately trying to go in your practice? What is the ultimate goal? If you say Nibbana, what is it that we know about Nibbana? Nibbana is a touchy subject. Early on in my training, I learned from very big monks, we cannot write about what Nibbana is, but we can tell you what it isn't. I thought that's interesting. So we can never paint Nibbana, you see. 
but we can we can um, talk about and we can probably experiment with what we prefer. Of course, it all comes down to preferences, blues, pinks, you know, whatever. If we're painting Nibbana, what is it that we you see, then it gets personal. What do I want Nibbana to be? Nope, doesn't work. There's nothing personal about it. I am not involved with it at all. It, it, we say no concepts at all. Ooh, no concepts at all. I love to talk about Nibbana. Nibbana has no concept, a place of no concept at all. What is a concept? Bhante went to this often. Monty would say, this table that's in front of me, the table is a concept, but is it the legs, are the legs of the table, is that the, is that the table? What is the table? You see, what is it? Is it the, uh, the wood, the leg? We do it with an automobile. Most of the time he does it with an automobile. Automobile is created in a concept room at the automobile industry, the it all begins with a concept room. You heard about concept cars, Tesla's concept cars. Well, that's this concept of an automobile, but where is the automobile? Is it the wheels? Is it the seat? Is it the steering wheel? Is it the engine? <laughs> it goes on and on, but it gets even more fun when we say, what is Nibbana? We cannot even speak of it because language is really where it gets fun. There's no word in the entire English language that is not a concept. We even tried to apply it. I was walking around trying to apply it while I was working in the center, uh, you know, and I'd come back down for lunch and say, I've got it, you know, what about a and and the? <laughs> a indicates uh, something, right? One, it indicates one A, okay? The, well, you go there, you can, you can wipe that one away too. I can't remember what Bhante said about the. A and, and indicates a message of two more than. <laughs> so you cannot go to this place because you cannot talk about this place because you cannot write about this place but you can talk about what isn't. There's no tension and tightness, none whatsoever. So whatever it is you're trying to do to get to Nibbana, it cannot be something that is making, having something to do with creating tension and tightness or working with tension, your tension and tightness. The removal of it, yeah, but there isn't any tension and tightness. So then it comes down to me, myself, full of tension and tightness, <laughs> tension and tightness and having it and not having it and living without it. And is it there? And does it cause a problem? And whoa, here we go. Yeah. So all these elements of this Nibbana, it's this void, it's a void, oops, void, oops, <laughs> 121, 122. And what is the last line in 121, 122? Can you tell me, can you remember what it was? Um, yeah, and as to what is, um, and as to what is, let's see, I, I always, I say I'm gonna know that by heart, wait a second, I'm almost there. Um, yeah. It's 121, the last page of 121. Yeah, he understands that which is present thus. Okay, he understands, here we go. He regards it as void to of what is not there. So what's not there, it's void, it's gone. But as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus, this is present. So no matter what it is, when it's void of that, there's always something. This is okay because they decided that space is not a vacuum and they decided that, that space has something in it. And when I pressed and questioned someone from MIT that I know, 
uh, about what is there then. They said something intelligent. I said, where did you go with that? How did you, I, didn't, I stopped the conversation at that point. Something, something in, intelligent. We're not gonna say what it is, but it isn't, but this is present. See, so all of this is fun, but coming back, let's come back to Badali. What do you think? Surely Badali, a transgression came over you. And he goes through this thing about the training. Uh, concept and he says suppose the bhikkhu were liberated in both ways and he starts to talk about the different ways that they're they are um they are um liberated and such did i stop do you remember where i stopped can you tell me was it 12 i think it was 12 if this is what do you think were on a uh, a, that occasion, one liberated in both ways, one was liberated by wisdom or by body witness, or one attained to a view, or one liberated by faith or a Dhamma follower or faith follower. These are all the different levels of people that come to Buddhism, all the different levels of people that come for all the different reasons they come to Buddhism, not necessarily the key story or key goal or key objective. So it gets very interesting. But darling, on that occasion, were you empty, hollow and mistaken? Yes, venerable sir, I was transgression overcame me and like a fool, I did that. So then he goes up here and I think this is where he says, uh, we forgive you. Uh, in uh, 13 and 4, it is the growth of the noble one's discipline. For the sake of the growth of the noble one's discipline, one's transgression as such and makes amends in accordance with the Dhamma by undertaking restraint for the future. So the whole system with the, with the rules, precepts, regulations, the whole system is set up so that comes back to your goal your objective. And if you break a precept, you must understand. You can play with it, kid around with yourself and say it doesn't matter, but you need to be going to someone if you're serious about someone who is a supporter or someone who is similarly practicing and apologize and ha have this, this accepted and then you move on. So it's teaching you to let go and everything on this entire path, on this entire training and this entire rules, entire precepts, entire training is all moving towards letting go, towards abandoning, relinquishing, allowing, letting be. This is all that it's about, letting go, letting go, letting go. So in the case of this person who came and uh, had some questions in, in, in reference, we have about feeling, we have to go back and say, but what was feeling and look more closely at dependent origination with the person that I was talking about in order to help them, to coach them and such, we have to find out where they think this is sitting. Where is, where are the four noble truths? Where is dependent origination? Where are the seven links? Do we understand how we're working with all of this? Do we understand why? Do we understand what we're trying to do? reboot the computer <laughs> reboot your brain that's what you're trying to do you're supposed to restart your brain turn it off turn me off and turn it back on and see what happens if you have the information the knowledge of the construct when you come back on how long can this stay with you that was an interesting thing we had a retreat recently and some of them they held on to it for a good period of time. Some people went through the first time and were able to hold on to it for like a week long. It's a long time, you know, the first time that you are able to do this. But the more you understand really clearly the, the construct of this whole trip, the construct of the investigation of where you're going, of what you're doing and the abandonment and relinquishment and how that's all supposed to be working, then when you experience turning off and turning back on, you relax into it with less and less stress because you understand how it's working and you take care of it. Now, those women I talked to you about 
uh, that I like to talk about the nuns that were the Catholic nuns that did this program that I taught last, I think it was last year in September, a year ago. Some of them held on to it for six or seven months. How'd they do that? And they kept practicing and they kept building and they kept sitting long because they had that time to sit long. That's one of the luckiest things they had. In their daily construction of their life, their programming, they have this time for personal prayer or personal meditation. They take it, they use it. And that's one of the supporting factors for it is to keep using it and keep on experiencing that empty place. Okay, let's keep going, Badali. Some bhikkhu does not fulfill the training. He considers, suppose I were to resort to these different places, these different types of resting places, and the wise companions in the holy life by the gods by himself, but he realizes no superhuman states, it doesn't happen. So here, Badali, some other uh, monk does not fulfill the training uh, in the dispensation, he considers, suppose I were to uh, were uh, to resort to these places, all the same places we talked about, he resorts uh, to some such secluded resting place. And while he lives thus withdrawn, uh, the teacher does not censure him and his wise companions, um, and they do not censure him and the gods do not censure him. He does not censure himself and being uncentered in that way by the teacher and the wise companions and the gods. And by himself, he realizes a superhuman state. How does he do that? A distinction in knowledge. Something comes very, very clear to him. And vision, very, very clear understanding of, very, of the noble ones. And quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, he enters and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with joy and happiness, born of seclusion. Why is that? That is how it is with one who fulfills the training in the teacher's dispensation. Now, while in this stilling, the stilling and a, and a, a, of thinking and examining thought, he enters upon and abides in the second jhana. And then with the fading as well of the joy, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana. And with the abandoning at that point of pleasure and pain, he is now, uh, he uh, enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana. And why is that? That is how it is with one who fulfills the training of the teacher's dispensation. Fulfills the training of the teacher's dispensation. Understanding the knowledge and the wisdom behind the Eightfold Path, the Four Noble Truths, the Dependent Origination, the Eightfold Path. Understanding the step-by-step -step system of the Four noble truths for your personal investigation. Knowing every time you go in, there is suffering and the cause. Yep, go ahead. Uh, I've got a question, uh, Sister Kima. Uh, going back a couple of paragraphs, paragraph 14. Yep. Where, where the meditative being, or the bhikkhu is being censured by everyone. And it also says he censures himself. Yes. And that it's, uh, and even that is not good enough. Because is this because he's not gone through the, the process of, if you like, verbalized uh, um, confession and the process of receiving forgiveness? In my opinion, yes. So I think this the, is a really. The, 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 you know, I'm you not. can, uh, you can be, um, and it doesn't have to be bringing God from heaven to forgive you. I want to make this clear. This can be a person of the of like mind, of like training. It is the same to another human being. This uh, There's something that happens for us with um, forgiveness that is a functional thing to ask for forgiveness, literally. You see? Yeah. What if we were, what, what if we were practicing in isolation? 
would would it be effective in that context to to verbalize the transgression to uh, to the Buddha, to a Buddha Rupa or whatever, and ask for forgiveness and retake the precepts if we were in isolation, or do we need to do something different? Yeah. No, I think that you could do it in isolation, but I'm Irish. The reason I'm saying that is my Irish tells me everything's alive. So if I'm doing it to a tree, I'm perfectly happy and I'm doing it to you. I'm doing it perfectly happy. So what I'm saying is the person has to, you know, I, I just, this is my personal feeling. I mean, I uh, lived with someone who was a um, agnostic and was never going to have anything to do. Was he was not there wasn't, what, what is the other one, the more severe one, it's no, no God at all, okay, it was agno agnosticism, but he never really was balanced, I don't think, uh, because he couldn't do this with somebody, you know, he needed to have somebody to do this to, and I've seen this with, you know, have you ever been with somebody who's dying, well, if you have been with somebody who's dying, who desperately wants Forgiveness. They want forgiveness. To give this to a person who is dying, you know, who's been injured in a severe or a real traumatic uh, disaster or something like that. Of course, you give them forgiveness. And nobody's going to say they didn't have forgiveness given to them when a person can give this to another person. This is what we, the disconnect that we have today with each other is the very unfortunate thing in humanity. Very unfortunate thing. And I, I don't know how, uh, how it'll all come out in the end, but it will work its way through some sort of a system eventually to come to some place because humanity has to come to a commonality. I mean, I used to laugh about Ronald Reagan saying the little green men are coming and that's going to be the day when they come in their ships and they land. That's going to be the day he he did that in a speech before he left the presidency. You know, it's very famous about that. Yeah. But he's making a point. At some point, some time, either we have to figure this out. Or, you know, then humanity will be superseded by the king of the jungle or whoever else. You know, we will not be at the top of the heap anymore. I have trouble understanding why they say we're at the top of the heap. <laughs> I have trouble with that one. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> when something's blatantly in front of you and you have something as organized as, for instance, the UN, and you say they're going to do this and everything, and you teach these kids that it's all real and it's going to actually fix something and never does anything. It's just, uh, it's not that it never does anything, anything. It's that it doesn't do the anything that really needs to happen, which is an organized program of commonality between humanity and each other. Because the most important thing is their survival. And yeah, my uncle was right. It all comes down to one thing, pure water. That's it, pure water. That's all his last words were. It all comes down to pure water. And what he meant was we were trying to get to the bottom of all this month after month for four years when I was in Asia and he was in the States. And we talk like once or uh, every couple of months for an hour on the phone like that. And we never could come to this one place. And that was for him. That was it. Yeah. Um, I was just wanted to reinforce your comment about forgiveness um, and, and people dying. Uh, and so I had a client who uh, I worked with in hospice and, uh, and I took her through the forgiveness meditation. And, and this was really, really transformative for her. Um, it was really, really helpful. And, and certainly from the beginning to before that to after that, uh, there was a, a definite shift in, in mind. It can be one of the most uh, tremendous things that can happen for a person to be able to have somebody with you at the end and just be open to helping them look at that program. 
You know, it's a very, it's very um, basic, simple thing um, to look at yourself and forgive, forgive, you see? And then anybody else, and also I will point out to you, I don't know what was happening for her, but I've done the same thing. And, and uh, what I noticed that was remarkable was that within a minute, the person has people popping up, you know, very quickly, because that's normal as a person is dying. As the person is dying, we get to meet those people that left before us many times. People have the vision of, I see my father, I see my mother, I see my grandfather, I see my great grandfather, you know, I see these people, these per people that are gone already. And we see them at the foot of the bed. And this is not something to be laughed at or scoffed off at all, because it's too common. And it happens very, very often from the depths of inside your heart and your mind and who you were and your history. These people come forth and they're, are there like, you know, waiting for you to come to. So there's nothing, we can't explain these things. It's like I say to people, you know, this is the way you, this has to be when you die. I said, no, nothing has to be any way at all. Yeah, there isn't any has to be. <laughs> because, you know, we just simply don't know. But yeah, it's striking how happy a, how a person can leave. And um, I used to I used to rehearse my last words, <laughs> and I have. But I even now, if I uh, you know, was it's three words, and I don't think it's a curse to tell you what it is. But I don't know if I'll get to say it. <laughs> but it was just like it was good. It was good. That's it. That's it. I feel like I've seen enough. And I think this is the way uh, that Bonte felt in a conversation I had with him when I went to see him before he went really deep in and wouldn't come out again. And I think that that um, he feel he feels that he was here clearly for came for a particular reason, was here for a particular reason, fulfilled what he wanted to fulfill. The way he wanted to do it was, was happy with what he had done. And that was where he was. And so he didn't want to stay. It doesn't mean he's going to go commit suicide. It doesn't mean this. You know, that's not the same thing here at all. It is a person who is standing there looking back and seeing uh, where he's been and what he's done and he's done a lot you know it was an incredible amount that he did the years that he was in Asia the places that he went and the the uh the different groups he was involved with and his own personal search for um the Arahat and such as that which he never fulfilled and um you know it's it's amazing <laughs> that um that when he starts to talk about those things to me but the but the thing that was so clear crystal clear is you know why can't they understand meaning all of us that i came and i've done what i wanted to do and and uh fulfilled what i wanted to fulfill and i that's it that's that's it. Why can't people understand that? I don't have an answer for him. And uh, it's uh, but he he's he's OK with this. He knew he was slipping, slipping, slipping. You see, he knew that was starting to happen. Yeah, I, I think the difficulty is because. For people who, who are not the inquiring in the way that, that perhaps he he was, um, everything is measured by outcomes in terms of, of, of deliverables of sort of fixed things. And actually what he started, it's a bit like the turning of the wheel. Uh, he, you know, he started a process and, and the process has its own own energy. It's not, it's not his energy. It's, it has its own energetic component. And, Whilst there are people who are 
interested in and and committed in in, in what he taught, the, the wheel will keep turning. Um, uh, yeah. The, the gift that he gave was is, you know, starting that process off. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. And, and that's 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 it. Whereas I think outwardly other measures can be uh, applied and they can be seen in that sense, so much more needs to be done, but no, the, the you know, the process has been started uh, and that's, and that's yeah. the work that needs to be done. Yeah, exactly. So I need to get strong enough to go to Africa now. <laughs> you know, I was telling someone the other day, I really wanted to do that, you know, but I just, I uh, don't think that's going to happen, but um, yeah, and he did. He we we used to sit and talk about seeds a lot, and that's what we were seeding. You know, we used to talk about Johnny Appleseed when I was driving across the country. We've been to places uh, throughout the throughout the west of the United States where we saw the trees that Johnny Appleseed had actually planted you know, in different areas. And it was very fascinating. The whole story of the apple in the United States is really an interesting story. So he's a real person and he really did that. <laughs> that was his way. And then we would uh, say, you know, that you don't know where you're gonna end up planting seeds, you know, in, in the town by, the, by where everybody's around you or a really nice farm or just in the middle of nowhere. You, and we would say, yeah, you don't know where you're going to end up sleeping. <laughs> like that was my story where, where the nun was going to end up sleeping as he's taking me around to show me and meet these abbots and uh, all these different temples in the United States. And um, they are making, figuring out where they're going to put me to, to sleep that makes it all okay. And that's <laughs> really fun. <laughs> So uh, there have been many, many stories about that, yeah. <laughs> so let's go back to this and see if we can go through the rest of the way, because this has some has some switchbacks in it, but I want to try to keep going. Okay, um, so you see what was happening, okay? And then as we turn the page, now we go down to 16, we're up 16, 17, okay? Then he was, con when his concentrated mind, is thus purified and bright, it's unblemished, rid of imperfections, it's malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability. He directs it to knowledge of the recollection of past lives. Now you go back to 51, section 24, and all of this is going to be a, a, a flip back to um, 24, 25, and 26. So you listen to this one, and this is the way that he was teaching me, which is fun, because I found it later, and I went running to him, and I said, this is the way you were teaching me, and he said, yep, this is the way I was teaching you. Um, when he concentrated his mind, when, with his concentrated mind, is, uh, is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of perfections, malleable, wieldy, steady, and un attained to the imperturbability, which is the fourth jhana and beyond, in the, you know, Arupa jhanas, okay, he directs it to knowledge of recollection of past lives. So what it's telling you here is when you do this practice, he is trying to make sure that you understand you have to be into the, um, have this kind of a mindset. It, it's purified, it's bright, it's unblemished, it's rid of imperfections, it's abandoned anything that is looked upon as an imperfection is something that makes your mind uh, tight or occupied in any way. And then he directs it to the knowledge of the recollection of past lives. Once again, okay, malleable, wieldy, steady, means you still have control in your observation attained to imperturbability. That imperturbability statement is telling you right where it has to be to that level before you can do this. He's telling you this. He directs it to the knowledge of the recollection of past lives and his manifold past lives of one birth, two births, three births, up to a hundred births, thousand, hundred thousand births. And you can go on and on and on. Bonte had one student that did a hundred thousand, 
something like this through, I can't remember, one or two eon things claimed that she was able to do this. And um, this is the many eons of world expansion, eons of world contraction and expansions. This is your time frame in when you're talking about uh, Buddhist uh, cosmology. You're talking about the time frame from the um, the burst, like or the uh, what do we call that in science? The main explosion from the little tiny prick of light, bang, and then you have the expansion for a period of time. Big, big bang. bang, thank you. Big bang, I got that one. The big bang happens and you have an expansion. Now the length of the expansion goes out and as it is expanding, there is life. That's where life happens from that, that, that powerful energy that's expanding. When it gets to where it stops, it rests and rests for the same length of period of time as the expansion. Then the contraction begins and it comes from the con contraction, comes in to contract down. That's where everything is going to wipe out everything. That's where everything, no life can exist. In the stage of contraction, no life can exist to the point where it then rests again and rests in a spot for the equal amount of time. Contraction, rest, okay? So you have big bang, that length, rest, contraction to the um, rest again, and then the big bang, okay? So this is a cycle. Now they go back, I love it, in the Science Museum. In my lifetime, I saw them change all of this to agree with what the Buddha said. I think it's great, okay? So there I was, so named, this is the clarity of remembering now. This is the clarity of remembering, depending on a lot of things. If you're doing past life regression work, you don't have to spend the time doing all of this kind of thing of the person is so named, you know, you can know your name, but you don't have to know all this other information of clan, with such an appearance, you might know the person's appearance comes up pretty easily. And then such as the nutriment, you might remember what you ate, the experience of pleasure and pain, the life term, and the passing away from there and then appearing elsewhere. Okay. When people talk about regressions that um, they're working with, a lot of times, and this is in the uh, most recent research has been done on regression work, you know, there's some books out there that are claiming a lot of times people will uh, land in the position on the day the person's going to die so that you can track and go before and it flips back, 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 back like that. But you you can show up on the day the person's going to die. That was very convenient for me because I wanted to know how how I uh, about lives where I died from falling. And it's not me that died, I'm trying to understand this whole thing, but there was another being that died in the same way of the sphere. And what happened was by understanding, arriving and, and, and being able to identify a place and a person and the age of the woman and that the person dies that day and could see the person fall off the roof or fall off the wall or fall off the mast of a ship or fall off into a big crack in a ravine in the pasture or off a cliff, I was able to say something interesting that the fear that I had all of a sudden at 51 years old of falling, of getting, of, of climbing even a small ladder. And you have to understand with me, this is serious because I never was afraid of heights at all, ever. Okay. And then all of a sudden, by seeing these people die that from falling, I realized the fear somehow had nothing to do with this lifetime. It was coming through from somewhere else. And because of that, the phobia disappeared in a couple of days. And all of a sudden I could go up to the, we were, we were using, Bunty and I, we were using the fire 
tower as our test site. If I can run up the fire tower without any fear at all and my legs don't lock up and I don't turn white, then we're finished. <laughs> and, but when we started, I could only go up one level of staircases on these things have five staircases. Um, and I would throw up and I couldn't, you had to come up and get me to get me to come down. So I was absolutely terrified. And this all happened in a short period of time. We don't know why. So this is the kind of usefulness, like an application you might say for life. And another woman after this happened, had a, 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 had, I had a chance to help a woman who was afraid of drowning, who went back and was trained long enough to, to be stable enough in order to go back and remember when she drowned. And then she comes out of it. She had no trouble with sitting with her kids in the river on a chair in four inches of water after that, you know, just splashing around, but she couldn't go near the river at all when we started. So these things are, are usable. And, and it says here is explaining, I, exper I experienced elsewhere uh, the appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience, my pleasure and pain, my life term passing away from there. I reappeared here. And um, when I reappeared, uh, this thus uh, with the their aspects and particulars, I had recollected these manifold past lives. And then it goes on, he says, after this part, if we go back to 65 in section 19, uh, when his concentrated mind was thus purified and bright, uh, attained to the imperturbability and all of that, again, he directed his knowledge of passing away and reappearance of beings. Uh, thus with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, he understands how beings pass on according to their actions. Okay, so now what's happening here is he's going to go visit hell. And that's possible too. So you can go down, have a sit down, and somebody shows up and, and just, it's not easy to do this because you're terrified. But if you do this, you can, you can, this can be very familiar to you, like you're smelling, you're feeling the temperature, you are smelling and touching things that are, this is all wrong, and you're no longer sitting there meditating, but if you open your eyes, you are, but if you close your eyes, you're there, and it can be very, very real and very frightening, but the person can sit there, and if you're willing, uh, what do you say, um, communication without speech, what's it called? Telepathically, that person will sit there and talk to you and tell them exactly why they're there, what they did and why they're there. And one of those was plenty for me. And I felt like throwing up and came out and talked to him about it and said, it's all well and good. I understand what this is. Don't plan on teaching it to anybody. And <laughs> I don't want to do it again. You know, if it's okay with you, let's keep going. And why... Basically, the person, if you are keeping your precepts really close and you are doing everything precisely the way that uh, you're supposed to be, you, you can learn to do this. And, and it's examining the reality. To me, that was a real thing. And if you go back in this one to um, you go back to uh, 25. Um, It'll explain this one better in 51.25. When he concentrated his mind and was there with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, he's seeing beings who are passing away and reappearing inferior and superior, fair and ugly. Why are they coming back in these different ways? Fortunate and unfortunate, he understands how beings pass on according to their actions. And these worthy beings who were ill conducted in body, speech, and mind. They were the revilers of the noble ones and the wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong view and in their actions and in the dissolution of the body after death, having reappeared in a state of deprivation and in a bad destination in perdition and even in hell. But these worthy beings who were well conducted in speech and body and mind who were not the revilers of the uh, the noble ones, 
they were right in their views, but giving effect to right view in their actions on the dissolution of the body after death, having reappeared in a good destination in even in the heavenly world with the divine eye, which is purified, surpasses the human. He was able, uh, he sees the beings passing away and reappearing, inferior, superior, fair, ugly, fortunate, unfortunate, understands how beings pass on according to their actions. In other words, it's a huge lesson in what goes around, comes around. That's what this is. And if you have a question of the validity of karma, and it's like I was trying to encourage people not to get overly involved in discussing karma because the Buddha advised against it so ferociously because you can just go on and on. And there's always reasons not to understand it or not to accept it. Um, then he's not going to spend his time teaching people how to do this. He was adamant about that because it's not, it's not your purpose. What he brought you in this lifetime, in this span of one lifetime, was the ability um, to totally go through and with a, with a balanced set of knowledge and go through to the point of our hardship and just not come back, ever have to go through this again. And so this was his gift. This is what he wanted to teach. This is what he emphasized. So you don't, no matter which books you go to, you're not going to find a whole heap of lessons like this one that's going to talk about this stuff because it wasn't primary. And you're going to find more examples of how you shouldn't get involved because there's almost no possible way you can prove it other than personally experiencing some of it. Okay, then we go past this one. When, when his con concentrated um, mind is purified and bright and all of that, he directs it to the knowledge of the destruction of the taints. Now he's coming back to earth. Okay, he understands is it actually that this is suffering. Now he goes back to 5126 and it gets more to the point. He says, basically, he directs his knowledge of the destruction of the taints. He understands is it actually is this is suffering. And he understands as it actually is, this is the origin of suffering. And he understands as it actually is, this is the cessation of suffering. And he understands as it actually is, uh, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. So he's saying unquestionably, without a doubt, very precisely and exacting through your own personal knowledge and vision, direct knowledge will reveal to you how these things work and how life actually works. And so he understands as it actually is that these are the taints, the blockage of this understanding. He understands as it actually is the origin of the taints and he understands as it actually is the way leading to the cessation of the taints and the, what's leading to the cessation of the taints is the repetitious and uh, the repetitious practice of the right effort repetition repetition until mine empties naturally empties there isn't any more anything more to this this is where we have just volumes and volumes and volumes and libraries and temples back from floor to ceiling and palm leaves yet un untranslated piled up in cabinets everywhere in sri lanka and thailand and burma and everywhere but there isn't anything more to it than this, is understanding the taints, the origin, this, the, uh, the cessation of them, and the way to the cessation. And by using the practice of, um, of right effort and constantly, continually doing that, then the mind, we know through, how do we know it? How can I say we know it? From neurocognitive science today, we know this. I just went over an article that I wrote in 2018. And it was when I first, uh, it was when I first read the information in regards to um, the neurocognitive science and what it really meant. I was so excited, I couldn't help myself. I just could not believe how exciting this was and why didn't we hear about it? And we're reading about it in 2018, 2016, 2018. Why hadn't we heard about it? Why is this is one I can understand when you finally mm, discover titanium is more strong than steel, but the public doesn't 
isn't told anything about it for another 50 years. But this, how could you not be telling people? <laughs> I mean, this told everybody in the world, nobody is stuck in their behavior anymore. Nobody is stuck and you're always going to do this. You, nobody can sit in a relationship, point to the other guy and say, you always do this and you're never going to change. Nobody can do that anymore. Why? Because people can change. Because it might be harder for an older person to change than a younger person, but the methodology and the systematized way, the system, systematized method is right there and proven. And actually now you can watch it on an MRI and an on F MRI. You can do it once as often as once a week until you watch that anger management um, you know, pathway disappear and turn into a big pink one that's called loving kindness instead. Well, maybe it's not pink, but <laughs> I can imagine anyway. So that's, that's what is, is so cool about this is actually coming to the place where you, you, um, you found that. And, and I went back over the article and thought, you know, I need to pull this out. It needs to be published someplace. It never was printed. And, um, and I pulled it out and uh, pulled off from I can't, what I didn't have. It's kind of sad. I had a, I was supposed, I, I know somebody told me I had to go do something and I stopped and I, I did pull the link for the article that I had pulled the chart off of. And so I'd have to go back and spend some time online trying to find that particular chart. I had the chart and then I revised the chart to show you how it works with right effort. And it's only like 2,400 words. It's not so bad for me. That's really good. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so this is how Vidali goes through this thing. Now let's see what else is happening here. He does that. Thereupon the Venerable Vidali, um, Venerable Sir, he is saying, what is the cause? What is the reason why they take action against some big, some monk here by repeatedly admonishing him? What is the cause? What is the reason why they do not take such action against a, a monk here by repeatedly admonishing him? Why you do it here, but you don't do it there? Well, Badali, some monk is a constant offender with many offenses. And when he is corrected by the monks, he prevaricates. Now we get these good words. He prevaricates. It means he dances around the problem and doesn't, doesn't admit to it. You know, he leads the talk aside. He shows disturbances, hate, and bitterness. He does not proceed rightly. He does not comply. He does not clear himself. He does not say, let me so act that the Sangha will be satisfied. And taking account on this matter, he does not think it would be good if the Venerable One examines this monk in such a way that this litigation against him is not settled too quickly, or the monks examine that monk in such a way that the litigation against him is not settled too quickly, so that all kinds of things can happen so that this doesn't work. You don't, the admonishment doesn't work. But this is where all these little things in this paragraph on 23 is what the teacher needs to watch out for. Because right here is where you're going to let your student go. If he doesn't quit doing it, you're going to let him go. Because if you spend time trying to teach someone who is always going to go around the issue, prevaricate, lead the talk aside when you're trying to explain. I know someone I'd like to talk to very seriously, and I probably won't try because that's what's going to happen. It would be led aside. It would be pushed aside too quickly. And um, and the uh, disturbance or argumentation would come up and proceed, things wouldn't proceed rightly or comply and they would not give an answer, would not say, but would take the person asking, try to take the person, ask the question around in a circle and drag them all over the place. And the question is for the teacher, of course, do you want to subject yourself to this? But the, the deal with a student, if you're working with a student, is do you want to keep putting time into working with the student? And there are legitimate reasons why not to keep working with a student 
who insists on these kinds of behavior. Okay, but then here, another bhikkhu is a constant offender with many offenses. When he's corrected by the bhikkhus, he does not prevaricate the, the talk aside, show disturbance or hate or bitterness. And he proceeds, rightly complies, and he clears himself. And he says, let me, please let me act the way the sangha will be satisfied. And the bhikkhus taking account into the matter, think it would be good for this venerable one the venerable ones to examine the bhikkhu in such a way that the litigation against him is settled quickly. So he could continue with his pursuit of the, uh, of his, of his uh, objective in his practice. So he can continue with his practice. And the bhikkhus examine this monk in such a way that the litigation against him is settled quickly because they know that he's really earnestly trying to correct himself. But then here, um, some uh, bhikkhu is a chance offender without many offenses. And when he's corrected, the bhikkhus, he prevaricates and he does all kinds of other things. I'm not sure where this one goes. Oh, it goes back again into the section 23 and 24 and repeats itself. And um, the bhikkhu should examine this bhikkhu in such a way that the litigation against him is not settled too quickly. That's like if you go back in 23 and reflect on that one again, it's saying um, don't do it so it's settled too quickly uh, because you need to find out what really happened. And then uh, another one in 26 is, but here the monk is a chance offender without many offenses. And when he's corrected by the monks, he uh, does, not, um, does not dance around. He does not prevaricate. And the, the monks examine the bhikkhu in such a way the litigation is settled quickly because he really earnestly wants to be corrected and he wants to do continuous journey. This is what you're trying to do. Find the good ones, keep those good ones in the front of the pack, keep working with them sincerely. It's up to the teacher how much patience they have. Bonte had tremendous patience, unbelievable, for long periods of time, you see and would not say it's time for you to go home, okay? <laughs> but, but on occasion, it's time for you to go home happens actually too. So here are some, uh, some monk progresses in, by a measure of faith and love. And in this uh, case, the monks consider friends. This monk progresses in the measure of faith and love. Please let him not lose that measure of faith and love as he may, uh, if we take action against him by repeatedly admonishing him. Suppose a man had only one eye and that his friends and companions and his kinsmen and relatives would guard his eye and thinking, let him not lose his one eye. And so too, this monk progresses by measure of faith and love. He's trying very hard and let him not lose the measure of faith and love uh, that he may, if we took action against him and repeatedly was admonishing him in the wrong way. You have to be careful and be kind. Then this is the cause at 28. This is the reason why we take action against some monk here by repeatedly admonishing him. And this is the cause. And this is the reason why they do not take such action against a monk here by repeatedly admonishing him. Now, venerable sir, what is the cause? What is the reason why there were previously fewer training rules? This is a good place to mark this so you find it again. It's a really good one. Why? What is the reason why there were previously fewer training rules? and more monks became established in final knowledge here and now. What is the cause? What is the reason why there, is, are, now, there are now more training rules and fewer monks become established in finer knowledge, in, in final knowledge here and now? That is how it is, Badali. When beings are deteriorating and the true Dhamma is disappearing, then there are more training rules and fewer monks become established in final knowledge. So you have a lot of monks running around and very little knowledge running around in their pockets. And okay, and they're not able to teach a lot. So the teacher does not make known the training rule for disciples until certain things that are the basis for taints become manifest here in the Sangha. 
But when certain things that are the basis for taints become manifest here in the Sangha, then the teacher makes known the training rule for the disciples in order to ward off those things that are the basis for taints. Now, all of the training rules that the monks have to deal with have a story to go with them. And that's the way that you should be learning them if you're going to study them. You should not stay and study with a professor that gives you the book and said, here it is. We're going to go through all these training rules so that you know what the training rules the monks follow. Don't do it. You need to learn how it all happens. And then some of it's just absolutely his, just it's almost you want to cry. And some of it you feel like laughing so hard you'd end up under the table. <laughs> But you know that there had to be a rule, otherwise lay people would not respect the monks. And all of it was done to protect and, the, and continue the existence of the monks. And this is one of the reasons why these training rules have no place for the lay people. And they're not supposed to have them in a book on the shelf to refer to and say, you monks shouldn't be doing because you don't know. You do not know the whole history of that rule. And you don't really know what's behind it. It is not your domain. And one of the most dangerous things that has happened in the, in the dissolute, dilution of the Dhamma, the dilution which is upon us, is what happened in one country where a, a monk just decided to just write a book and publish it. And that's what started the whole thing. And then all of a sudden, there they were. And all of a sudden, then all the discord happened between lay communities and monks and such and so. But they didn't have it. That's a funny thing. They didn't have the whole story. They only had the book with the rules. Do you remember that? Okay, now here, um, the certain things, the base, okay, we can't. Now, 31, those things that are the basis for the taints do not become manifest here in the Sangha until the Sangha has reached great things. Uh, greatness, okay, and when, but uh, when the song has reached greatness, then those things that are the basis for taints become manifest here in the song, and then the teacher makes known the training rule for disciples in order to ward off those things that are the basis for the taints. That they, that it's all about again protection of the song for the protection of the teaching. Now those things that are the basis for the taints to not become manifest here in the Sangha until the Sangha has reached the acme of worldly gain, the acme of fame, the height of fame, I think this means, okay, uh, great learning, long-standing renown. And when the Sangha has reached this long-standing renown, then those things that are the basis for the taints become manifest here in the Sangha, and then the teacher makes known the training rules for the disciples in order to ward off those things that are the basis for the taste. So once again, it's about protection. And there are few of you, Badali, when I taught an exposition of the Dhamma through the simile of the young thoroughbred cult. Do you remember that? Vidali, there were only a few of you when I taught you this way. Now, now we listen to this. No, venerable sir. To what reason do you attribute that? Venerable sir, I have long been one who did not fulfill the training of the teacher's dispensation. And that is not the only cause or the only reason, but rather by encompassing your mind with your mind. I have long known you thus. When I am teaching the Dhamma, this misguided man does not heed it. He does not give it attention. He does not engage it with all his mind. He does not hear the Dhamma with eager ears. Still, Vidali, I will teach you an exposition of the Dhamma through the simile of the young thoroughbred cult. Now listen and attend closely to what I shall say. And this is how you teachers should be watching your students struggle. This is exactly what's happening. The blessed one then said this lesson. Badali, suppose a clever horse, a clever horse trainer, he obtains a fine thoroughbred colt. He first makes him get used to wearing the bit in his mouth. 
And while the colt is being made to get used to wearing the bit, because he is doing something that he never has done before, he displays some contortions, some writhing and vacillation, wiggling and moving. But through constant repetition and gradual practice, he becomes peaceful in this action. When the cult has become peaceful in that action, the horse trainer further makes him get used to wearing the harness. And while the cult is being made to get used to wearing the harness, because he is doing something that he has never done before, he displays again some contortions, writhing, and vacillation. But through constant repetition and gradual practice, he becomes peaceful in this action. And when the cult has become peaceful in that action, the horse trainer further makes him act in keeping in step, in running in a circle, in prancing, in galloping, in charging, in the kingly qualities, in the kingly heritage, in the highest speed, in the highest fleetness, in the highest gentleness. And while the cult is being made to get used to doing these things, because he is doing something he's never done before, he is displaying some contortions, writhing and vacillation. Because through constant repetition and gradual practice, but he will become peaceful in those actions. And when the cult has become peaceful in the actions, the horse trainer further rewards him with a rubbing down and a grooming. And when a fine thoroughbred cult possesses these 10 factors, he is worthy of the king in the king's service and considered one of the factors of the king's worth. And so too, Badali, when the bhikkhu possesses 10 qualities, he is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of reverential salutation and an unsurpassed field of merit for the world. And what are the 10? Here, Badali, a bhikkhu possesses the right view of one beyond training, the right intention of one beyond training, right speech of one who is beyond training, right communication, and right action, harmonious movement of mind's attention beyond the training, and the right livelihood, harmonious lifestyle of one beyond training, and the right effort of one beyond training. This is the right practice of one beyond training, and the right mindfulness, the right observation of one beyond training, and the right concentration, harmonious collectedness of mind of one beyond training, and the right knowledge of one beyond training, and the right deliverance of one beyond training. And when the monk possesses these 10 qualities, he's worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of reverential salutation, an unsurpassed field of merit for the world. That is what the Blessed One said, and the Venerable Badali, he was satisfied and delighted with the Blessed One's words. Each level of your practice is a new skill, and the solution is the repetition and the gradual practice and purification and retraining of your mind. It is the gradual practice and interest and curiosity and patience. Those three pieces, interest, curiosity, patience, has to be added by what? Added by Samoyama, by right effort, that practice. That is the support system that he gave, the system of the horse Badali trained. So this is the lesson as we learn it today. Anybody got any questions? <laughs>
Okay. Just, just, I just wanted to pick up a, a point which you, you mentioned earlier, but just to kind of uh, clarify it in my own mind. It's in paragraph 23. Uh -huh. And this is where we've got uh, someone who's constantly offending or that and is being censured, but uh, uh, okay, and then, then, then he says, um, um, when he's corrected, uh, uh, he prevaricates uh, and the rest of it, uh, he does not comply, does not clear himself, he does not say, let me so act with the sun, go be satisfied. Now, the biggest right. taking account of this matter, uh, it says that he should be um, he should be examined. What seems to be like at length, so that he no it, no no. Time, it says it, it, it would be good be... if no. It says if it would be good if the venerable ones examined this bhikkhu in such a way that the litigation against him is not settled quickly too quickly. Well, what, yeah, that what that means to me, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that you know uh, he should be uh, or they should be um, uh, questioned, if you like, over a period of time, so that they get the opportunity to let uh, the understanding sink in. Whereas if they were forgiven or quickly, if that process was almost cursory, the opportunity for learning is not there. Yeah, that's what a lay person would say. But what we would say in here, give him time to cook. Let him cook in the way he's behaving. Let him see how it really feels. That's what we would say inside. You can oh, see, but, so, uh, so. see what, see what um, Dhamma Gavesi says. I don't know if he's here, but that, that's where, that's where Bhante wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't come down on you right away. He, he would. He would, he would, he would send me away and let me cook in my attitude to see what oh, it was really so going to feel like. Give it some time. Is that where uh, you go, Bunny? Uh, so, uh, see, in uh, Vinaya terms, if you are doing a certain amount of uh, uh, kind of uh, error uh, in your uh, actions, so there are levels of that. And a certain le uh, level of action uh, which is required is required uh, for the Sangha to get together and uh, kind of uh, admonish that monk and give a corrective action. So uh, one way of looking at it is that you don't uh, kind of uh, uh, dismiss the uh, complaint or uh, dismiss the uh, thing which is uh, premature or in a uh, manner which requires uh, the corrective action. So uh, in Vinaya, uh, there are uh, levels of uh, errors in actions and there are corrective measures. So the corrective measure can be uh, confessing to the monk uh, or an another fellow monk. It can be senior, junior uh, monk, uh, they can confess. Second is uh, they have to re relinquish. So they relinquish that uh, item which they had acquired, uh, uh, which was not as per procedure. Then there are uh, actions uh, are required uh, by the monk as a corrective action, that he does a corrective action. Uh, like uh, certain times he will uh, kind of give up his seniority in the line of the uh, lunch. Uh, so uh, uh, in going for Pindapata, he will uh, maybe uh, be in the last in the line. Those are the kind of a corrective actions he takes. He gives up his seniority for a certain amount of time. So those kind of things uh, means that uh, what is the error and uh, the action is to be comp uh, means uh, to be uh, equal to the uh, error and uh, nothing has to be dismissed uh, kind of quickly uh, to kind of uh, not uh, take up the uh, take it take it up as per uh, the vinaya. So it has to be uh, properly handled. Okay, uh, so Bhante, what would your understanding be about uh, that the litigation against him is not settled too quickly? What, what... Uh, it means it is not dismissed uh, that, okay, okay, uh, we will uh, kind of uh, uh, get, uh, get uh, we are these four months are there, uh, we will just uh, resolve this issue uh, over here. Uh, not like that. You have to do it in a proper manner, which is required. 
So okay. if the 20 monks are required, then we uh, we get those 20 monks and do the procedure. Okay. So uh, it is not like you do not dismiss the uh, uh, issues uh, offhand. So okay. certain things require uh, 20 monks. And sometimes what happens is you have to go through the whole district to get them because uh, that area does not have a monk or they're not free or something like that. So it's a whole big process to do that. Uh, okay. So uh, we have to kind of uh, take that into account that sometimes it may be a kind of a temptation to kind of say, we'll kind of settle this up. But that is not how you have to do. You have to do it as well, proper procedure. Certain uh, are uh, where you can just confess and that is the end of the story. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's very good. Thank uh, you. Because Vinaya, yeah. Vinaya was a lot of things uh, which we had to uh, learn and deal with. <laughs> yeah, because there are situations where sometimes the monk has to like leave the group of monks and with a group of other monks and um, he has to be retaught a section uh, of rules and stuff in, in uh, private and then he has to come back afterwards. So in order to do that, you would have to go and get like 10 or 12 monks to all go together. So everybody's witnessing everything and it's all above board, everything. So it's very carefully done, very, very carefully done. It's one of the reasons that still exists is uh, amazing, you know, 2,600 years of, of having this type of uh, organization to still exist and still be functioning in parts of the world. It's not necessarily operating fully in a lot of places right now, but it is operating enough that it is still a very strong and steadfast presence that you can say that this is remarkable and it was done this way. And this is unbroken, which we say is unbroken is because the Upajaya, the person who ordains has a record of the uh, person he was ordained by. So see, if my uh, ordination has been done by Bhante Vimagramsi and his ordination has been done by some monk in uh, Thailand, his ordination is also recorded. And that ordination can be traced back to the Buddha. So this is an unbroken chain. And uh, it required a lot of effort also. Like when uh, Sri Lanka two times had a situation where there were no monks which were kind of clear uh, in the sense that they had, uh, they were not 100% sure that this monk has not committed parajika. So they uh, were kind of, uh, or was not ordained, uh, maybe not ordained correctly this monk. So they had to kind of find a, a monk who was uh, uh, ordained properly. So they went to Thailand uh, and uh, got ordained and brought back the uh, uh, kind of uh, lineage back to Sri Lanka. Once uh, it happened in uh, uh, Thailand, they were not sure. So they came to Sri Lanka that time. And uh, one uh, king who ordained as a monk in uh, Thailand went to Burma as well as Sri Lanka to ensure that uh, he is ordained by uh, somebody who is uh, properly uh, ordained and he has a, uh, this link to the lineage. So that is the reason we say this 2600 uh, year lineage is unbroken. So some monk Buddha uh, ordained and that monk ordained another monk and till now, till date, uh, we would have that uh, linkage if somebody were to trace it. So that is the reason that is an important uh, factor, you know. There's no other uh, system which is 2016 old and has that kind of record of Buddhism. <laughs> it's just a technical <laughs> thing. <laughs> Thank you, Bhanti. So anybody else have a question about this? Okay, well, I'm happy. Yeah, Sarah. Hi, thank you so much. Um, it was a question to do with the um, past lives teaching that you talked about. And then mm -hmm. I'm just curious about the juxtaposition of using that with then simply using the uh, teaching in the present time. When, when, and I understand that the story that, you know, around it was very helpful with phobias. Um, so it's really just a question, why, why, why do we need it? Or when would you use it 
in the sense. Oh, that it isn't. It, no, it isn't. It, yeah, it isn't a need. It's not like a need. It's not in the training. It's it's up to a teacher if they decide to take you on that path. That's just something that Bonte decided, you know, when I was training with him. And actually, when this when the incident happened in reference to the um, the height is what set it off. You know, in this case, it wasn't. He's he's pointing out to me, this was a path of training that. And I can't remember how that worked. Um, yeah, I guess it was the first time. The first time was why why did I ha hit my head so often? Uh, you know that that was in two thousand and two. That was when I was I first gone through, uh, and and then uh, that whole thing was revealed because I found out who I was before. That was a whole different issue though. This one, the phobias, I was interested in the fact that later on at the center, and I, that was much later, uh, well, the old house was still there. So you have to say it was probably before 2010, something like that. We didn't, the house hadn't blown away yet. Um, and, uh, I needed to go up on the roof to clean the rain gutters is what happened because it was draining into the kitchen. It was leaking through the ceiling. And the only way to fix it was to open up the drains so that when it came off the roof. So he sent me up on the roof with a big spoon. And I, but the problem was when I got to the roof, it was that quick that all of a sudden I'm terrified of heights. Well, what happened? And as soon as I stood up on the roof, I, I had to get him to come partially up the ladder to, to, to make sure that he could hold the ladder so that I could get down. It was absolutely just, he thought I was going to have a heart attack or something. I was just bright gray. And that's why we did that. We did it as a solution. Yeah. You are still on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Is it like something like a, 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 fast, a fast track? um for when there's a, a a disturbance when there's already obviously a significant development you mean no so obviously you've got to have a significant development in your practice even to be able to do this past life regression work no and no, actually, anybody can be taught, but it's a difference is people blocking it because of all kinds of things they think about time. That's usually what blocks it to, to have a person roll it back. The same problem exists in, in uh, hypnotism, in hi hypnotic treatments, you know, using hyp hypnotizing someone as a modality and using that the same problem exists is they don't believe it's possible. So they try to block it, you know, with this is like time blocks it. Um, yeah, there's a there was a like a fast track a, a fast track path where the teacher could decide to have you uh, try the the past lives and then the other one that was mentioned. What was the second one? Yeah, and Bonte explained that, and I said, well, I you know he he I didn't ask for it, and he never asked me. He was just taught me. He he never asked me. Do you want to go this way? Do you want to go that way? It was the tendency of the student how they were doing where you would send them need deciding to send a student into forgiveness and seeing that they were blocked set that kind of thing he saw the opening and um he saw the opening for where is it the second part that was explained yeah mm -hmm. Where is it? I can't find it. It's um. One one thing I can uh, tell about in the suttas, uh, the uh, factor of uh, past life is shown as a kind of a knowledge or a kind of a information which you uh, yeah gain. three uh, knowledges. Uh -huh. There it is. Three knowledges. Yeah. yeah, you look up three knowledges in your look up in three knowledges in your index. Can you do that for me? A look up, um, I think you'll find under knowledges or three knowledges. Uh, uh, 
so mm -hmm. this is basically uh, for yeah. uh, understanding how uh, your attachments are there uh, to kind of a personality you know the, that personality which is there currently uh, was not the personality which was there and how uh, uh, the process of uh, the impermanence happens so buddha sees that uh, where we were born what was the food which was there what was the nutrient right. and uh, what was the uh, kind of uh, the end uh, so uh, it is like uh, seeing uh, in uh, uh, fast forward or uh, uh, what is happening kind of uh, in in that uh, life so how were you born how how did you live your life what was your food and how how did you kind of pass away then again it happens and again it happens and again it happens so the futility of uh, the uh, kind of we are uh, in, in my case uh, uh, i ca can could not kind of uh, uh, envision uh, this life uh, being uh, anything uh, other than the totality of the time okay so if i was uh, 25 then I was thinking that if I, I have to die at uh, 75, I have only 50 years. So my uh, perspective of life was in this 75 years. But the Buddha is saying uh, in many, many ways that even uh, say one says that uh, the tears you have uh, shed for your relatives, that would fill all the oceans in the world. So that is uh, kind of giving a perspective of how many times you have been born. And then you have to kind of uh, multiply it with the difficulty of becoming a uh, human, as born in, as a human being, which, which is shown by a uh, kind of a turtle and a ring and all that simile you are aware of. So that means that the enormity of the time is something which is very difficult to comprehend. It took me kind of many, many, many years. Uh, for me to be kind of able to imagine and comprehend. And I am not all, uh, all the way there, but uh, you can understand that this uh, thing can be kind of more easy when you are kind of doing the past life regression than when you are seeing your, uh, you being born and re, uh, reborn. Then uh, one thing happens is the impersonality you are aware of, the imp uh, impermanence you are aware of. And uh, how the Dukkha is uh, uh, centered around the impermanence of the things. And how impersonality is the kind of escape which uh, kind of Sivanema teaches. So those things can be kind of a, a more clear to you when you are doing this practice. So the one way of doing it is in this manner. Yeah. So with, from that that description, um, it's something then that you 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 would feel is very um, is very helpful because it's a, it's an it's an aid to um the understanding of how everything knits together and the dependent origination um the way dukkha nietzsche and Arta are all all connected um so it's a it's a yeah it's a help it's a helpful adjunct and development and consolidation and is, is that how we would look at it and that yeah. it's something we could are we, are we looking well? are we looking at the practice of it is that what we're looking at yeah, as a, as a practice, and as a practice, yes. Yeah. The, the difficult part, uh, the difficult part of teaching somebody past lives, what's the, what's the, what's the curveball here? In a sangha, there are group, uh, you know, there's usually a teacher available. There used to be, let's put it this way, there used to be a teacher available and a group of monks that were able to reference to this teacher who was knowledgeable enough about teaching past lives that a person could very uh, you know, practice this amongst people who understood what was going on and have the teacher at their fingertips. The thing that is unsafe about teaching past lives to people is that if you're not in proximity of a teacher, it can be dangerous. And dangerous is the only way to put it because it's so real that when you are sitting there and you're meditating and all of a sudden things start smelling a different way, or you open your eyes and you're not in that room, it can totally freak you out and you don't know what you will see. And a lot of times, like I was told when I was doing this, the work on this, you know, on why, why did I have 11 concussions by the time I was 16 years old, 11 concussions where I hit the same spot on my head every single time. How, why? That's the, that was the question into this whole thing. Okay. And it's it turns out- 
Yeah, it turns out I opened my eyes. I am not in that room. I am sitting there with a dead body in front of me with worms and snakes in his stomach and a woman across the room from me, like maybe 10 feet away. And the stench was unbelievable, unbelievable. But I'm still in the house in Florida in a room. I'm nowhere near where this is. What would I have done if Bonte hadn't been there? Because I broke the sitting and went out to him and said, okay, what the heck is going on? And was literally shaking. And then he said, I remember I told you that part about none of it is real at all. None of it is real, but you can't accept that none of that was real. You cannot accept it. I cannot get this across to you strongly enough because it was so real, I could reach out and I thought that I could touch that body. You see what I'm trying to say to you? And you know, I've had, I worked yeah. with one student one time and I'll never do it again unless they're in proximity with me. And, and he told me in the future, if you're teaching, you don't ever teach anybody um, unless they're in proximity with you. And this person pushed me and pushed me and pushed me and they were in another country for heaven's sake. <laughs> and they didn't have anybody else to talk to about it. You know, so what can I tell you? Go find somebody who's willing to do it. And then when you find out somebody that's willing to do it, um, then you have to find out their credentials and whether they ever actually did it. And then you have to find out who taught them and whether it's all legitimate or not. It's, it's dangerous is the only word for it. It's the only word I can say. But in a Sangha situation where you are amongst Sangha today, you tell me, Bonte, some of your monks would think that you were absolutely gone crazy and mad if you were practiced this way. Isn't it true? Because they don't have any experience with the stuff we're talking about. They haven't been reading these texts and they don't, you know, they don't have anything at all, much at all to base it on as far as experience. So where do you find teachers to do that? I don't know. I was really lucky that I had Bonte. Very, very lucky. Yeah, but that's all I would say. So as far as thinking about ha having me help somebody do it at home, I don't want to do it anymore because of what happened. You have to be established in the fourth jhana uh, as per the suttas. Uh, they say that it's like uh, water uh, which is there, uh, which is filled to the brim. And then whichever way you incline, the water can fall. So then after you are established uh, well in the fourth jhana, then you can kind of uh, slip into uh, psychic uh, uh, things also. But one they also warned that many of the times it is also inclination of your mind. If you are inclined to certain uh, this thing, it may happen automatically. Like uh, right. you have students who have kind of uh, without uh, him teaching or without them kind <laughs> of uh, wanting have uh, developed a divine eye. Um, yeah, and he had somebody, he had somebody do open her mind. And then he had somebody that was a student who um, just started thinking about what we're talking about and opened his eyes and was on a ship and the person was next to him and he could smell the salt water and feel the salt, uh, the, the moisture in the air from and feel the ship going like this and came running down the mountain. You know, like what in the world just happened to me? And that was something that was uninvited. It was just something that had briefly been talked about and that decided to, to, to attempt that, uh, but just casually, you know, just thinking about it, not even sitting in meditation to do it. Yeah, so there's a person that's really ripe and ready and inclined to do it who never wants to do it again. He doesn't want to do it again. He doesn't want to try it. So where'd he go with all this? I don't know. <laughs> But what it what is it proving to you? It is proving, it is proving. Um, it's it's a it's a uh, the part about sitting next to somebody in hell is basically proving to you uh, that karma is a real thing. More than anything in my life, proved to me that that was something that was absolutely real. Yeah. I just want to pick up a point that uh, Venerable Donald Gavisi said uh, about the importance of equanimity for this. Without the without the economist mind, um, then uh, there isn't the the settledness to simply observe. I mean, the twin is right. all about simply observing what's going on. 
And if you can then treat, treat this as another thing to simply observe, rather than uh, own or make part of us, yourself uh, as a personal experience, but simply as something that has information in it, uh, in the same way that we look at some of the Arupa jhanas, that there's information in the Arupa jhanas to be seen and understood. Then there's a stability. Without that, then it's almost like all bets are off because there's difficulty distinguishing between what is a real experience and what is an unreal experience. Um, not saying that the Upajana experiences aren't real, but they're not personal. That's, that's the key thing, I think, from what, uh, from what I understand of what you're saying here. Yeah. Exactly. It's very good, yeah. So, shall we say prayer? Okay. <laughs> yes. May, may suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.